Joe Amato in the near lane race against Gary Ormsey in the far lane. It was this run down the quarter mile strip that changed the history of the sport. But Joe Amato astounded the crowd and the racing world by becoming the first driver to crack the elusive 260 mile per hour barrier, forever establishing his name in the record books. And it was this same type of dedication to excellence that won Joe his first ever world championship title in Top Fuel. Hi, I'm Ed Bruce. And for the 16th year, race fans have gathered here at the Gator Nationals in anxious anticipation of top drag racing. Brock Yates and Steve Evans are here to call the races for us, and they tell me to expect the unexpected. So let's go to them for their thoughts on today's competition. Joe Amato certainly is a very special racer, Ed Bruce. For the second year in a row, he has brought a brand new race car here to the Gator Nationals and qualified it in the number one position. But the reason for this new car is not performance, because Joe's definitely got a handle on that. It's safety. The biggest concern among top fuel drivers, just like Indianapolis car drivers, is foot and leg injuries. So Joe, after an awful lot of experimentation and studies, has come up with an aluminum foot box. His legs are contained in this unit in between the chrome molly frame rails. Formerly, this was just open area. The feet were not protected. It's made out of 90,000 aluminum. It's very, very strong. It will crush and still protect the driver's legs. So Joe feels uh, very comfortable and very safe in this new automobile. For the Funny Car Story, Brock Yates. Thanks, Steve. I'll tell you what, you got some hot cars and top fuel, but believe me, the funny cars are every bit as potent. In fact, in this case, maybe a little bit more potent. This is Kenny Bernstein's Topaz that came to the Gator Nationals and qualified at 261 miles an hour. That is two miles an hour faster than the fastest top fuel car. Moreover, Kenny, as you remember, last year at the Gator Nationals was the first funny car driver to exceed 260 miles an hour. It's kind of cool here today. The racetrack is dry. We got a little bit of a tailwind. So who's to know what kind of big speeds we're going to see here today with these machines, the funny cars. Well, Brock, as you're well aware, there's been some bizarre happenings here in North Central Florida during qualifying and first round action earlier today. First of all, in funny car qualifying two days ago, in the near lane, Bob Gottschalk of Toledo, Ohio. The engine explodes, the car is on fire. Gottschalk has no idea where he is until he hits the woods, sawing off trees with six-inch diameter trucks, setting the woods on fire. The NHRA safety support got him out of the car. Again, a horrifying fire. We've seen it so many times, an engine fire, an explosion inside one of these funny cars, and it looks as if the driver is in deep trouble. Of course, he's got chalk, has lost his visibility, lost his steering, the chute's gone, totally out of control. It looks as if it's going to be a terrible accident, and with massive injuries for the driver, incredibly, got chalk, walks away. Watch the huge rear slicks as they just explode off the wheels from the heat. Rubber flying everywhere. Now the onboard fire extinguisher system did its job until it just ran out of charge. Then Gottschalk had to contend with the burning woods as well. This easily could have been a life-threatening situation. But as it turns out, Bob Gottschalk is back at the track after a single night in the hospital. Well, I'm sure that Bob Gottschalk would be the first man to tell you that the safety uh, requirements in NHRA uh, drag racing are meant for the driver, and it sure paid off for you in, in that incident yesterday. Yes, it did. I, I want to thank Simpson Safety Equipment for fine equipment that they do put out. Bob, uh, it's one of the, I guess, drivers fear far more than anything, and uh, you you just came away with some burns on your hands, and that was just where, this, as I understand, where the stitching burned away on the gloves? Right, the uh, stitching burned the... Uh, some blisters on my hands and my thumbs burnt uh, pretty bad where I had to unfasten the seat belt. But it, considering the amount of fire and the time you were in the fire, it's a, you got to just feel really happy that all that equipment worked as well as it did. Yeah, I'm very happy and very lucky to be here. Amen to that. The main reason Brock Yates is talking to Bob Gottschalk right now is that the NHRA Safety Safari team arrived at that car in 14 seconds from the time the fire erupted just incredible. There was also some big trouble in the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator earlier today. Gary Beck in the far lane, two-time world champion from Hemet, California, faced off with defending Gator National champion Joe Amato. Amato's car in the near lane is the one to watch. They blast off the starting line side by side, but at the three-quarter mark, watch the car in the near lane. A tremendous supercharger explosion. Well, basically the same thing that happened to Bob Gottschalk, although Joe Amato's engine is behind him and out in the open. So the fire, while spectacular, 
aircraft had none of the uh, dangerous implications that the Gottschalk fire had. Joe was able to deploy the chute, roll to a stop, and what's more, he was a victor. Now, Amato has been fighting this kind of supercharger problem. You'll remember our coverage of the Winter Nationals. He blew a blower off, beating Don Garlitz in the same way earlier today he beat Gary Beck. Now, the rules require restraining straps on those superchargers to try to keep the pieces on the engine. With this kind of force, I'm not sure anything would hold him down. Those holes are where the blower attached to Joe Amato's motor. So complete was the destruction, it looked as if the mechanics unbolted it. When Joe got out, Steve was there. Well, somehow, the motor held on long enough, Joe, to get the wind light, but it is destroyed. Well, it just blew the blower off, basically. The bottom end is probably okay, but you can't keep blowers off every round. That's the second one this weekend. Yeah, you know, there's something plaguing us a little bit here in the, the mechanical part of the car. We're going to have to get after it and get it straightened off for the next round. Did you feel you were going to, you had enough momentum to get there first? Yeah, I thought I'd pull away pretty far on Gary, you know, and, it, you know, I, my plan was to let up on the car and not run it through, but as it turned off, the blower went off before I had a chance. But Joe Amato is victorious in the Battle of the Giants, uh, but a new motor is going to have to go into this car. So a quick handshake from the beaten Gary Beck, a hug from wife Jerry, and Joe Amato heads back to the pits with his crew to replace that engine. The stands are packed, the pit area is crammed with race cars, and we've got some round two action coming up that'll include this man, the legendary Big Daddy Don Garland. Saw uh, Joe Amato's blower explosion. Well, Steve Evans is in the pit to assess the damage. There's blower explosions, and there's blower explosions. These are the pieces brought back to Joe Amato's pits by NHRA Safety Safari. He really has nothing to do with them, but uh, carry them on down to the Aluminum Recycling Center. You figure just this one piece here weighs about 15 pounds. That'll give you some idea of the force involved in one of these blower backfires. Now, what generally happens is the uh, intake valve hangs open in one of the cylinders. That allows the fire out of the combustion chamber to get up into the blower and kaboom. More important, really, than the $3,000 supercharger, however, is that all of the fuel system in this explosion was lost as well. And that is really the speed secret on any of these very quick top fuel motors. So Joe Amato in the background with his crew installing another engine to go after him in round number two. Boy, this was a bad one. Well, let's not forget, Steve, that nitromethane is a pure explosive, and that is what fuels these cars. We've had threatening skies, a little bit of rain here, as this man, Big Daddy Don Garlic, fires up his top fuel car for round two action. His opponent will be a man almost as old as himself. Bill Mullins in the far lane from Pelham, Alabama. He's been racing for over 25 years, but only his second season as a top fuel driver, driving the machine owned by John and Shirley Carey. Don Garlitz, of course, won everything that this sport has uh, had to offer. One of the greatest names, if not the greatest name in the history of the sport, from just up the road in Ocala. And he has reappeared here at the Gator Nationals for the first time in a couple of years, and I'll bet you thousands of fans followed him through the gate. No question about that, Brock. As for Bill Mullins, a long career in alcohol cars until moving into the top fuel ranks. Big Daddy, what is there to say about him except that he always shows up at the races with something new? If you're a veteran of our drag racing telecast, you know that there's been a big problem with the top fuel drivers pitching off their front tires at the finish line. In fact, after three successive tire losses in last year's U.S. Nationals, Don Garlitz was heard to say, something has got to be done. Well, thanks to Goodyear, something has been done. It has debuted right here at the Gator Nationals, the new frontrunner tire. Now, unlike the imported motorcycle tires used previously, this has an awful lot of wire running around the tire for stability. It has a much deeper bead for more contact with the wheel. And more importantly, most importantly, it is tubeless because it's a tube that can wrap around the steering, creating some big problems. It mounts on a special streaker, two-piece aluminum wheel that has a rubber O-ring to prevent any kind of air loss. Now, Goodyear has spun this tire in their laboratory to 320 miles an hour, and it stays on the wheel. So, apparently, the problem is now solved, and a tip of our hat to Goodyear for a big step forward in safety. Right you are, Steve, and hopefully all the top fuel cars will be carrying that kind of wheel in the very near future as we watch Big Daddy back into position here for his race against another veteran, Bill Mullins. Well, you got 104 years of drag racing drivers on the starting line. Garlitz at 53, Herb Parks out in front of his car, his crew chief. Bill Mullins, as we said, 51 years old, but both are incredibly physically fit. And I think on their minds right now, is the traction there. If you mentioned there's been rain on and off, it can affect the racetrack. And I would look for both of these to be very careful. 
Well, Bill Mullins has come into Top Fuel with a fury and uh, has run very well. As you said earlier, the car well prepared. All the latest equipment on his side as well as Garlitz. We know Garlitz will have the latest stuff, always has. So this should be a very, very interesting matchup between two veterans. John Garlitz getting comfortable in the rather cramped cockpit. He's won 23 national event titles, one world championship. Bill Mullins in the far lane still looking for that first top fuel victory. It's a cool afternoon, taking a while to get these engines up to temperature. And I'm sure, Steve, that it caused some guesswork on the part of the crew chiefs in terms of clutch adjustment and fuel mixtures here. They are off right together. Mullins is sideways. He corrects the car. They are wheel to wheel. Bill Mullins has defeated Don Garlitz, but flowed his engine in the process. How close can they be? One one hundredth of a second. 5.67 for Mullins to Garlitz, losing 5.68. Well, they call Big Daddy maybe the greatest driver in history, but he was clearly outdriven here by Bill Mullins, who got his dragster sideways just about here, corrected it with, don't forget, about 3,000 horsepower out of control right behind him, and drove on right past Big Daddy to score an upset victory. There you see the margin, a matter of feet for Bill Mullins, and a beautiful, beautiful drive. All right, Bill Mullins. That has got to be your biggest win since going into the top fuel category. Without a doubt, without a doubt. I know they'll be going crazy. That's uh, the biggest win of my life, I guess, right there. You know, won two national events, but neither one of them were any bigger than this right here. And neither one were in top fuel. You had a slight hole shot, and you needed it. It was within inches. Yeah, I wish I could have got a little bit more of a hole shot. <laughs> going into the semifinals, and here comes a crew that is delirious. But I have a feeling their celebration is going to be tempered just a bit when they take a look at that engine. A lot of repairs are going to be necessary before round number three. Brock is with Big Daddy. Don Garlitz uh, checking for damage here. Obviously, the engine has been hurt in that run. Don, tough break. Uh, what what was it that you think broke in the car? I don't know. It's uh, pushed a gasket out or something. Lost power part way down? Yeah, that was it. Oh, well, we're sorry we we're out, but uh, it was a tough, it was a tough go all the way, wasn't it? Yeah, really, it was a long wait, you know. Yeah. One of those things. Yeah. Good try. Sorry you're out. Okay. Hey, Bob. Thanks. Don referring to the long wait after a shower soaked down this Gainesville Raceway, but it's plenty dry now as Top Fuel Round Two continues. This is the long, sleek car of Gary Ormsby from Roseville, California. He's an automobile dealer and a professional drag racer, been doing it for about 20 years, but this is only his second year full-time on the NHRA circuit. Now, his competition will be Frank the Beard Bradley from Napa, California. Bradley takes a very conservative approach to the sport, tries to qualify in one run. He's a budget racer, not heavily sponsored, but enough to make it to all the big races. And a very experienced driver as well, Steve. Very, these are two poised men in these two top fuel cars. Should be an interesting matchup. About the same level of experience. Ornsby, as you said, in here with a brand new automobile. Debuted earlier this year. And a car that has some very advanced aerodynamics on it. Also, it is the longest wheelbase top fuel dragster ever built. Something over 262 inches from axle to axle. Well, Gary won the Winter Nationals last year and has uh, been in contention in all the big meets over the last couple of seasons, so he is definitely a force to be reckoned with here at the Gator Nationals. It is Bradley with the whole shot. Frank Bradley out in front. Suddenly, Bradley Supercharger explodes. Gary Ornsby goes on to an easy win. And here you can see that supercharger just hanging off the left-hand side of the engine. It happened earlier in the on the track than did Joe Amato's in the first round, so it didn't get off of the car. Let's take a look again. Watch that far lane. Here comes Bradley on the right side of your screen. It looks as if he's got a little bit of a lead, but suddenly it's all over right here. A massive explosion in that nitro fuel system blows the supercharger off, and it's all over for Frank Bradley. So Gary Ormsby goes into the semifinals with a very quick 5.63 seconds elapsed time and a big top end charge at 257 miles an hour. Headed back to the pit area, Bill Mullins and his young son. A lot of work to be done on that car. Motorcraft Gator National, Gainesville, Florida. Hi, I'm Brock Gates, along with Steve Evans and Ed Bruce. And we have got an all-Michigan matchup, Steve. Indeed, Brock. Top fuel second round continues. You hear the starter motor whirling, bringing the 3,000-horsepower engine to life of Connie Conrad Coletta, the bounty hunter 
from Ypsilanti, Michigan. He is up against this unpainted car of Dick LaHaye from Lansing, Michigan. Now, LaHaye's only crew person is his daughter, Kim. And she really is not just an ornament in this pit. She works on this engine along with her dad. They've had a long, tough row over the years. Campaign this car from coast to coast on a very, very slim budget. But believe me, high respect for Dick LaHaye among the professionals in the top fuel ranks. Oh, absolutely, especially his starting line ability. Now, Connie Coletta, he doesn't care. He'll blow the motor right out of the frame rails to beat anybody. He's just an animal when it comes to drag racing. Well, one of the great characters in this sport reminds a lot of people of uh, Chris the Greek Garamasinas and his driving style. Just relentless. Drives a car as hard as anybody. Never gives up until it's over. Can be traced back to the very origins of the sport. Now a wealthy man with his own commercial flying service. Connie Coletta, a great contender. Dick LaHaye and his daughter Kim make their living drag racing, but that's how they support themselves. Sometimes it's beans and sometimes it's filet, depending on the outcome of the race. And I guarantee anytime Dick LaHaye wins a big and H-ray national event, it affects his lifestyle. Not so as Connie Coletta, who has uh, gone from rags to riches in this sport. In fact, enough so that he can now field in many events a car not only for himself, but for son Scott. So win or lose here at Gainesville, it's not going to cause a whole lot of pressure on Connie's bank book. And Brock, a different approach, too, to the tuning of these engines. Dick LaHaye will run only as hard as he has to. He will gauge the opposition, say, okay, I need a five, whatever, and that's how he'll tune that motor. He can't afford to be blowing off those $3,000 superchargers like Joe Amato and Frank Bradley have done this weekend. Well, you wonder whether Connie Coletta has backed it off a little bit, too, uh, reckoning that maybe Dick LaHaye is not going to be as uh, massive a contender as some of the other guys here. Well, one thing Connie does know is Dick LaHaye will not be late on that Christmas tree starting system. In fact, these are two of the very best off the line, looking over the reaction time from the last couple of seasons. They're at the top of the heap. And believe me, that is an art, the idea of launching a 3,000-horsepower automobile weighing about 1,700 pounds is an imposing challenge for anybody and believe me anybody that can get off the line without lighting up those big slicks in the back is doing a fine job all right the staging process begins they have a handbrake in the automobile they release the brake slowly let the car creep into the dual beams on the starting line both lights are lit for Tommy coletta dick lahaye now inches forward when all four lights on the tree are lit they're off and the parachute takes out of Connie Coletta's car. He has no idea right now, probably thinks he blew the engine up. The cars vibrate and they shake, and in this case, shook the parachute right out of the pack. Dick LaHaye goes on to win it. Well, at 562, 252 miles an hour, pretty credible run. Let's take another look at how Dick LaHaye pulled a great upset here. The second we've seen today is Dick LaHaye drives out, as you said, excellent reaction times, but here comes Coletta's shoot, and suddenly a massive boat anchor just comes out behind that top fuel dragster and ends it for Connie Coletta. Dick LaHaye goes on to victory. The reaction time for Dick LaHaye was only five hundredths of a second off of that green light. That is very, very good. Coletta parachute problems are not probably would have had a tough time beating him. And here is Kim LaHaye coming up with the tools, getting that car ready to head back to the pit area. They will face up with Gary Ormsby in the semifinals, and those two will be only one one hundredth of a second apart. Dick LaHaye will have the lane choice because he is the quicker of the two when they get to the semis. Right now, the big question is, is Joe Amato's new engine as stout as the one that won in round number one? Well, he may have a little bit of a break here, Steve. He's going up against perhaps a man not as well known in the top fuel ranks as some of the others. Grant Stones from Edison, New Jersey, campaigns this car primarily on the East Coast. Not a regular competitor in the big national meet. So maybe Joe's got a little bit of luck, although Grant Stones is known to be a good driver. He is indeed. And I think right now, going through Joe Amato's mind, as he races a guy that he should on paper beat, don't beat yourself. Don't smoke the tires. Don't shake the parachute out. Don't go into a wheel stand. Just beat this guy. Well, Steve, over the years, we've seen uh, Californians dominate this sport with uh, the exception of Big Daddy. But now a lot of Easterners coming in. Joe Amato, a major speed equipment distributor, over 300 employees in his old Ford plant. Grant Stoms, as we said earlier, an excellent driver, perhaps underrated, could make this a very, very interesting contest. Indeed he could, Brock. Grant Stoms won a couple of division titles years ago, then kind of disappeared from the sport. It's nice to see him back. In fact, I recall at the Spring Nationals about 10 years ago, Grant Stoms drove a top fuel dragster from starting line to finish line, and the front wheels never touched the asphalt. 
well on any given day as they say in the National Football League true here as well and remember Grant Stobbs has got to be thinking about Bill Mullins who blow off Big Daddy and Dick LaHaye who beat uh, Connie Coletta earlier so uh, upset is definitely the order of the day here at Gainesville well Grant Stobbs getting himself psyched up to cut a light because that is his best chance of scoring that upset you're talking about Brock if he can get off that starting line first if Amato sees him out there he might reel out a little too much power and smoke the tires a lot of things could happen Joe Amato getting ready in that beautiful burgundy colored dragster perhaps the most finely crafted automobile on the top fuel circuit right now Steve indeed and this is his second new car to debut at the Gator Nationals we talked earlier he won last year with a brand new car scoring that 260 mile an hour first as they move into stage Grant Stumps in the far lane Joe Amato world champion here lane Grant Stumps cuts the light Stumps with a whole shot but here comes Amato no contest the far end of the racetrack Joe Amato is sizzling 5.52 second elapsed time even though he eased off to save the supercharger so the semi-final pairings Amato versus Mullins Joe of course has lane choice Gary Ornsby versus upset minded okay, Dick LaHaye now quick. let's go to Ed thanks Brock fans who attend an NHRA national event have a chance to enjoy the sport on many levels they can walk through the pit area and watch the world's best crew rebuild an engine in a matter of minutes they can keep abreast of the new technology on the manufacturer's midway. But the real reason, of course, they're here is to see the competition. I remember one particular race in Top Fuel that brought all the fans to their feet. It was billed as the matchup. 52-year-old Big Daddy Don Garlitz in his black car was in the far lane. And he was racing against three-time world champion Shirley Muldowney in the famous Pink Pioneer car. Without a doubt, one of the longest and most intense rivalries in all of Top Fuel history. It was the first round of eliminations. Garlitz, a Florida native, was racing in his own backyard and was being rooted on by many partisan fans. But the ever-popular Shirley Muldowney had a strong contingent enthusiastically cheering for her. Both cars rolled into the lights, were staged. All the fans were on their feet. Shirley was out first, but then something went wrong with her car. Garlitz pulled away to victory, and the fans went wild. Boy, did they ever, Ed. And we're happy to report that Shirley Muldowney plans a drag racing comeback in 1986. the snake Don Perdome warming up here Don Perdome will be going up against this car Brock from Oklahoma City Oklahoma or Long Beach California depending on the season that is John Collins and this is a brand new car you'll recall in our drag racing coverage last year Collins was involved in a terrible two-car crash that uh, destroyed his previous mount but he's back stronger than ever Sure is, fortunately uninjured in that one as we watch them both get ready to go here. The Snake, of course, has won major titles in both Top Fuel and Funny Car. One of the greatest names the sport has ever known. John Collins never had the kind of uh, success that a lot of people feel his skills deserve. He is a fine driver. Man, never really won any major NHRA competition, Steve. No, he hasn't, Brock, and through bad luck, I think, more than anything else. Now, these cars are so sealed up now for aerodynamic reasons that the only way you get any ventilation uh, is to open that escape hatch as John Collins has done. <laughs> no factory air on these things. In fact, not only is the driver encased in that fiberglass shell of a body, but he is fully encased in a, a fireproof suit that has very little ventilation as well. So these babies can get mighty, mighty hot. Fortunately, though, of course, they're only in them for a matter of a minute or so, but uh, the environment, highly hostile under the best of circumstances. Well, you figure a funny car run from start up to blast off lasts about three minutes and you're in a five-layer suit. Can get plenty hot in there. John Collins moving into stage. Don Perdome is already there. Perdome ran a fine 578 in round number one. He's been struggling but looks to be on the comeback trail. Let's see who gets off the mark first here in second round. Funny car action. Perdome finally makes that last few inches. Collins follows suit. It is John Collins away first. John Collins is going to beat the snake. Perdome just shut it off. Didn't like the feel of it. John Collins at 574. He is flying 256 miles an hour. Well, it was Collins all the way in this particular matchup as we watched the snake pull off early. Obviously disappointed at that performance. It looks as if the car misbehaved right from the start as we watch Collins come out. A little better reaction time on his part, but the car of Don Perdomes snakes right toward the inside. He's going to cross the center line, which would disqualify him anyway. He shuts it down. Steve's with the winner. 
So John Collins not only gets around Don Perdome, but John, your best ever elapsed time of 574. You have found the combination, apparently. Yeah, Steve. The teams worked real hard all weekend on it, and uh, we ran a 576 first round, uh, 574 this round. Uh, we've changed engines, changed fuel systems. Uh, Larry Frazier, Bob Kreitz, I owe it to them. They're the ones that done it. Occasionally a burden, Steena Rick Johnson can jump up with a 560, but steady 70s will win most drag races. Uh, we talked about it before we came into the race, and, and Gainesville's a pretty good track for me. And uh, that's what they said. If we could run mid-70s, that we'd probably get in the final here. I think we're looking at a very confident John Collins as he goes into the semifinals. So John Collins and crew head back to the pits to get ready for the semifinals. Here comes the next second round action. Kenny Bernstein, who ran here so well last year and then capped it off with even a faster top speed already this year, Steve. In qualifying, Brock, he ran 261 miles an hour. That's a new national record. If he can back it up within the required 1%, he can do that any time today. He will be up against a, a veteran with a capital V from Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is Tom Hoover, who has backed off his drag racing career just a little bit to pay more attention to the family wheel alignment business in Minneapolis. But nobody misses the game today, so it's just a fixture this time of year. Well, Tom Hoover, like Don Perdome, started in top fuel cars and then moved over to funny cars and became very successful there. So he is used to big horsepower, as is this man, Kenny Bernstein. Won about it all, except never has been world champion in funny cars yet. Tom Hoover from the Minneapolis suburb of Maple Grove is lucky to even have his old war horse on the starting line. Look at the far lane. That was in earlier Gator Nationals qualifying. Hoover on fire, but not nearly as intense a fire as we saw with Bob Gottschalk. It went out. It was strictly an oil fire, no fuel involved. I talked to him about all the work to get it back. Well, Tom, you and your crew had uh, a bit of work to do after the fire and qualifying. I sure did. We uh, had a long drought for a while. We're on a 580 number and uh, in the shutoff area. I had a bad rod bearing and pitched a rod out. And uh, I had a handful there that afternoon, but uh, we got it shut down, got it rebuilt, and uh, everything felt pretty good right now. Did you use the onboard fire extinguishers in that incident? Oh, yeah, I did. I mean, I've been in there before, and uh, it's not the first time. I had them out, and I got the car stopped, and uh, luckily I didn't hit the body at all, so we're still in business. Well, actually, the body looks in perfect shape, so uh, Hoover got that all sorted out, and let's hope the engine is in as good a shape as the uh, body after it survived that uh, bad little fire. Drag racers seem to thrive on what they call the thrash, Brock. They love to work all night. Everybody pitches in and helps. There's just no limit to what they'll do to stay in competition. We talked earlier about top fuel driver Dick LaHaye and his daughter for a crew chief. Tom Hoover's crew chief is his father, 76 years young, and he stayed up all night with the youngsters getting this car ready for the starting line. Tom's father's name is George, and at one time when Tom retired from the sport, George went out, hired a driver, and ran his own car. That's how much he likes to drag race. For Kenny Bernstein, a very important race. If he can back up that national record, it's worth 200 bonus points towards the world championship. Bernstein, who finished number three in the world last year, wants that title badly. He's just totally dedicated himself to winning the NHRA world title in the funny car race. Spent an enormous amount of time in the wind tunnel so far this season. That car, perhaps the most aerodynamic of all the funny cars right now, Steve. Absolutely, the most advanced funny car on this planet. Hoover goes straight up in the air. A wheel spin for Tom Hoover. He has to get off the throttle. Look at Bernstein. Can he back up the record? No. The speed, 251 miles an hour. Way short of the required 1%. But a terrific elapsed time at 571. Tom Hoover, he is done for the day. Gone here at Gainesville. The Motorcraft Gator Nationals continue. Everybody's having a good time with perhaps one exception. And stays with them. I know after a great 578 in round number one, Don Perdome, you went to the starting line with uh, high hopes in the second round. Yeah, I sure did. We really thought we had things under control, but uh, that's part of drag racing. You know, it's a different day, and uh, apparently we didn't catch it right or something, and we're tearing it down right now to see what's going on. So the postmortem already going on. You're already trying to figure out for the next race what happened? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we have a race next weekend, and now's the time to look at it, and uh, we'll just have to see it. You know, the cards are so violent anymore that if the least little thing goes wrong, you're history. Well, that's right. You know, the, you know, so much horsepower and you're trying to put it to the ground. And, uh, uh, and, and the fuel systems are very, very complicated. You know, we've been struggling with that for a long time and uh, apparently we're still struggling with it. Well, let's hope you find it quickly. Thank you. Well, a great champion right now in the midst of a little bit of a slump, but we know he'll be back. In the meantime, more second-round action. You recognize that car. That's the famed Blue Max. 
But inside the cockpit, a new driver, John Lombardo, has taken the place of former world champion Raymond Beadle and car owner. Raymond now just owning the automobile. John Lombardo, a terrific debut with the Winter Nationals and a fine, fine driver. Tom the Mongoose McEwen. In many ways, he is drag racing. From Fountain Valley, California, he collected the Big Bud shootout $40,000 at Indianapolis last year. McEwen backing up from his tire heating burnout. Now, you said Lombardo had an auspicious debut in the Blue Mac. Boy, you're right. Set the national record in his very first drive at 5.68 seconds. Boy, it's Beetle Blue for them. As well he should be, because John Lombardo is about as cool a head as you'll find in this business. Never shows much emotion, always very laid back, and you know, though, that he's going to stop on that throttle. As opposed to the very glib Tom the Mongoose McEwen, who tells me that after 20 years, he's enjoying drag racing more this year than ever before. If there is an ice man in drag racing, it's got to be John Lombardo. As you said, he just shows very little emotion, very cool, and that all works to his advantage because nothing ruffles his feathers. While standing right in front of the Blue Max is crew chief Dale Emery, who has wrenched that automobile to three world championships with Raymond Beadle in the cockpit. Well, it's time to stage. McEwen will be in the far lane with his Corvette-bodied automobile. In the near lane with a Ford Mustang. That doesn't look much like a Mustang, but trust me. They're staging up. They're ready. They leap right together. This is a good funny car drag race at half track. The advantage to Lombardo. He wins it in the Blue Max at 580, 251 miles per hour. Excellent race. It looked as if Tom uh, just lost the handle a little bit about half track, and it started to weave a bit on him. He gathered it up, but not enough to catch Lombardo. There you see the two automobiles just about neck and neck, but right there, Lombardo breaks away to take the victory. Little John at the far end of the racetrack collects his gloves and his helmet. The crew already down there putting a strap on that front axle. They've got to get it back to the pits. Take a look at the spark plugs. Probably replace all eight pistons, whether they need it or not, because you know it's going to get tough in the semifinals. All right, more second round action. You recognize that car. That's Ed, the Ace McCullough. That car out of the very formidable Larry Minor racing team. And a teammate of Gary Back, who went down to the first round of top fuel, so it's up to the ace to make Larry Miner some money here in Florida this weekend. And he's up against a guy who's had a lot of good fortune here on this track. A two-time Gator Nationals champion, Dale Boldy, Granada Hills, California. And the ace McCullough, well, he's just quite a guy. You can almost tell by the grin on his face there. You can have some fun with the ace. <laughs> And he drives as hard as anybody in the business as he backs into position. As you said, that uh, escape hatch opened a little, little bit of fresh air into one of those funny cars. Think about the peak generated by a 3,000 horsepower nitro burning V8 right in front of your leg. You know, one time, Brock, all a funny car driver needed was a lot of guts and a good reaction on the starting light. For Dome describes driving one of these things now like being an astronaut. There are four and five different levers in the car. You rich in the fuel system, you lean it up. At half track, if the guy's ahead of you, you go for another lever to make horsepower, even if it burns the motor up. There are There is just so much to do in these cars that guys are making mistakes that never made them before. What more, Steve? you got to shift gears at about half track. Remember the old days when it was a direct drive? So all you had to really do is uh, stop on the throttle and point it towards the finish line. Not so today as we watch the beautiful Oldsmobile of McCulloch stage over there, the Trans Am of Dale Poldy's. They're ready. They are indeed ready to run the mark together. Poldy with the wheels in the air, smoking the tires. He wins this race because McCulloch had more problems than he did. As simple as that. Poldy, a very fortunate man. Wins it at 521, 252 miles an hour. And look at this, another blower explosion. It came right through the windshield and now dangles on the hood of that automobile. Watch the car in the near lane. Let's see if we can see when it happens. Ed McCullough, he thinks he's going to win right now. And all of a sudden, the tires start to smoke and kaboom. A flash fire and another supercharger destroyed. Well, you got to wonder whether Dale figured it was all over because he got the car really sideways just about the point that Ed the Ace McCullough's blower went up. So, uh, Paulie here does a fine job of driving, gets back on the throttle and straightens it out and drives on to victory. Well, Ed McCullough is okay, Brock. You once described these cars as Formula Harry, and boy, what an apt description as we just saw. Semis, Poldy versus Lombardo, Bernstein versus Collins. Right now, let's join Ed Bruce. Ed? Thanks, Steve. 
Earlier we showed you Joe Amato breaking the 260 mile an hour barrier for the first time ever at last year's Gator Nationals. Well, his wasn't the only display of speed and high performance that we witnessed. In funny car competition, it was Kenny Bernstein, the Budweiser King, who was also determined to make a run for the record books. Bernstein arrived in Gainesville with the first ever wind tunnel tested funny car. He and his crew learned valuable information in the wind tunnel, prompting them to make key adjustments to the car's fender wells and spoiler, improving its overall aerodynamic ride. In the final round of action, Kenny Bernstein in the near lane squared off against John Collins. Collins was staged first, and Bernstein inched his way into the staging beams. Then both cars were off. It was a very close race, but Bernstein was a little in front at the finish line. It was Bernstein with a win and an incredible 260 mile per hour run. His crew and the fans erupted in celebration. Kenny Bernstein became the first funny car driver to top the 260 mile an hour mark on his way to the Gator Nationals Championship. The funny cars are getting ready for the semifinals. It is pro stock time. And Brock Yates, these cars can be the most difficult of all to drive. As a man named Harold Denton demonstrated during qualifying earlier in the Gator Nationals. Watch this as Harold goes for a ride. It made a perfect straight run, and just as it got through the finish line, it felt to me like uh, maybe the right rear tire went down. The chute came out, but it would never recover. It began to get a little crossways, and I got it back two or three times, and then the next thing I knew, it was going around. So Harold, when he sees the videotape of that crash, will realize the chute was not out until the car was backwards. This could have been the culprit that flapped right rear tire. Okay, let's go to second round pro stock action here at Gainesville. That beautiful 84 Thunderbird at the wheel. Frank Sikinski from New Caney, Texas, Steve. Well, Frank came into the Gator Nationals virtually unknown in big time drag racing. Just qualifying here, though, is quite a credit for it. Gordy Rivera, Yuma, Arizona. Always reminds me a little of Lee Trevino. And what a good driver he is. We saw him last season. Hole shot his way to more than one victory. He sure did, and always has a lot of fun. He never seems to be uh, undergoing a whole lot of pressure, but you know, as you said, he can squeeze the light as good as anybody in the pro stock ranks. It takes three or four people, even to crew a pro stock. Not going to Rivera. His wife is his only crew person. Rivera in the far lane. Frank Sikensky from Texas Airlines. It is Thunderbird versus GM. Sideways goes to Thunderbird. He's off the throttle. Gordy Rivera gets so close to the center line, he too slows down, but Rivera wins it. I guarantee you the starter was eyeballing that one because if you cross that center line, you are out. Rivera, 826, 145 miles an hour. Not big numbers, but he makes it into the center line. All right, let's go to the next pair of pro stockers. That car, Dempsey Hardy, Vero Beach, Florida. A beautiful black and silver Firebird. One of the prettiest pro stockers I've seen in quite a while. Dempsey Hardy Brock can drive anything with four wheels and doors. He's won in a couple of sportsman categories, never in pro stock. Butch Leo, Blacklick, Ohio, formerly from California, still called the California Flash because he can really get off the starting line with that Pontiac Firebird. Down at the far end of the racetrack is Brock Yates. He's with Gordy Rivera. Brock? Tell me about the track. Well, the track, the conditions at the starting line look real good, but it's out farther out, it's, uh, it's a little loose. That's where it's happening. Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, you get some rubber down and uh, you'll be a lot better yeah, as the next round. coming out pretty good now, so we should be start heating it up. All right. Good job anyway. Win them any way you can, right? Thank you. Okay. A very track-savvy comment from Gordy Rivera. The sunshine indeed will heat up that racetrack for better traction in the center of the track. 
Right now it's time for a pro stock battle between two Pontiac Firebirds. Butch Lill, the white car on the near lane, Black Lick, Ohio. Far lane, the beautiful black and silver Camaro of Dempsey Hardy. All of the pro stock drivers are carrying that black slack through the number in memory of Lee Shepard, four-time and current world champion who was tragically killed in a testing accident in Ardmore, Oklahoma recently. They will carry that for the remainder of the season in memory of a great champion, Lee Shepard. Butch Leo just thrilled the light. Butch Leo, what a hole shot, but he's all over the racetrack. Butch Leo is out of control. Dempsey Hardy wins with a 766, 175 miles an hour. Leo was lucky to maintain control of that automobile. He sure was. Show you how difficult these cars are to drive. As we watch that spinning rear slick of an 84 Camaro that belongs to Nick Nicholas of Jackson Heights, New York, and he has a task in front of him. Because facing him in the other lane is Warren Johnson in his brand new Oldsmobile Calais. Warren Johnson came within just a few points of winning the world title last year based out of Duluth, Georgia. Has held both ends of the national record. Now his competition, Nick Nicholas, this is the biggest day in his drag racing life. The first time I know of he's ever made it to the second round for Jackson Heights, New York. Well, let's hope that Nick's got it all gathered up with that 84 Camaro because Warren Johnson has been going like a rocket with that little Calais so far. It's a very twitchy car. He's had some handling problems with the automobile, but horsepower, no problem. And Warren Johnson's driving has improved so much in the past year, but at one time that was maybe his Achilles heel. Not anymore. He's as good up there as anybody. Well, he's going to have to be because, as we said, that Calais has been a bit twitchy. They're still working on the handling of the automobile. Nick Nicholas, left too soon, he red-lighted, he is disqualified. Warren Johnson will win this one twice. He gets to the finish line first as well. So Nicholas was right in gambling there. Without some kind of a hole shot, he had no chance. Warren Johnson rips off a 755, 182 miles per hour, and brought now a pair of Thunderbirds. And a pair of arch rivals as well. These two guys have banged heads for years and years in the pro stock ranks. The greatest champion of them all, I suppose, Bob Glidden, won it five times from Whiteland, Indiana, in that beautiful white Thunderbird of his, who had kind of an interesting moment in his by run during round one, Steve. Watch the near side of the automobile. Yep, the door just slapped, fell off. Glidden with his eyes as big as saucers crosses the finish line. I talk to him later. Bob, it's not enough to be a great mechanic anymore. you got to be a body man, too. Uh, we had a bad break. Uh, we had a door leave us. I guess must have been by half track. Uh, we had a... Some, I think I got in the wrong tracks and got in some pretty violent shape. And apparently the door blew off the hinge. And, well, a spare door is not something you would normally carry, so what now? Well, uh, if we don't piece this together, uh, Ricky Smith will probably will loan us a door, and uh, the lines might not, the colors might not match, but I think we, we'll get a door on one way or another. Good luck. Well, in fact, Bob got his own door repaired in time to go up against this man, Frank Iaconia, Totowa, New Jersey, who's just started to run Thunderbirds this year, Steve. That's right. He's won the Gator National several times with a Chevrolet, but he can see the handwriting on the wall. Glidden uh, had so much horsepower, he wanted a little of it, too. But research-wise and development, Glidden so far ahead of the other Thunderbird racers, it's pathetic in some ways. Now, Frank Iaconio, only his second race. With that red Thunderbird in the new line. What a great start by both drivers. But Glidden's car out launches Iaconio, outruns him in the middle, and on the other end, it is Bob Glidden going into the semifinals. Florida. That is Joe Amato's crew chief, Tim Richards, putting the finishing touches on that big Hemi engine for the top fuel semifinals. Right now, Brock Yates is with one of the prime movers in this sport of drag racing. I'm with Dallas Gardner, the president of the National Hot Rod Association, and while the fans behind us are a strong indication of what goes on in a major NHRA meet. There's much, much more to putting together an event like this. And Dallas, I guess, in the case of the Gator Nationals, the city of Gainesville, Florida, has a massive impact in you on it uh, when you come down here. Well, Brock, that's true. And there's, there's really something special that we have with the city of Gainesville that, that I'm not sure that we enjoy with many of the other cities where we go. Since we bought the facility and are a landowner, uh, we're a part of the community here, and the Chamber of Commerce and just the, generally all of the people of Gainesville truly support the Gator Nationals. I think they they enjoy what we do in motorsports, but they also just enjoy being a part of, I think, what we bring to the community also. Well, I'm sure, Dallas, that not only uh, is, it a, is it a massive uh, source of pride for the city, but I would think it would be a, a big economic boon as well. 
it has a very significant uh, economic impact to the to the city and to Alachua County here. The uh, the chamber did a, an economic impact study, and they've estimated that the the effect is about six and a half million dollars on the on the area, and they use a multiplier effect of some 16 million, uh, and obviously that's significant. So the anybody that says that motor racing isn't isn't a big business or isn't a major economic factor in a lot of areas around the country is just flat wrong. Uh, Sixteen million dollars wrong. All I know is you can't get a motel room for about 75 miles. Funny car, semi bundled you're looking at the nose of John Collins' car. He ran very well in the second round to get this far. And how about Kenny Bernstein looking to back up that 261 mile an hour potential national record? Collins moving forward. Bernstein is awaiting him. On paper, it would appear that Bernstein might have the better of it, but let's not forget that Kenny's had some problems with the steering all weekend, and it may not be sorted out yet. That could be a factor in this race. It could be. John Collins is the last to stage. Starter Buster Cap sends him on the way. It's a good lead. Collins is sideways out of the race. Bernstein straight as a string. Kenny Bernstein wins it. And how about this? He was trying to get the speed record. He accidentally got the national elapsed time record. 5.64 seconds. He has a previous run that will back that up within the required 1%. So he got 200 bonus world championship points he didn't even count on. Very, very interesting. And he was looking for top speed. Didn't get that, but he still got a chance because he's headed into the final. Here comes John Lombardo. Now let's go to Steve with Kenny Bernstein. Well, Kenny Bernstein, you've been trying to back up that speed record. You didn't do that, but you set a leg on the elapsed time record. <laughs> Low ET of the entire Gator Nationals, 564. Well, super. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going for the mile per hour and we'll be get the ET. But like I said at the beginning, the wind's the important thing. And if we get the Budweiser Motograph card in the record book, that's great. Well, hats off to Armstrong and the crew. They did it. Well, that was a picture-perfect run from our standpoint. What about from your standpoint? Yeah, it was real good. It was loose in the middle of the race course. After When I shifted the car, it really got loose and moved over towards the center line. But that's just the way it is. It still made it through, so it was a nice run. All right, let's go back to the starting line and see who Kenny Bernstein's opponent will be in the finals of the Gator Nationals. Well, Steve, if little John Lombardo and the Blue Max crew need extra incentive, it's that because Kenny took the ET record away from from them that they set earlier this year at the Winter Nationals. Dale Poldy, he just wants to do it. He's won here earlier in his career. He no doubt would like to repeat. So this will be Poldy versus John Lombardo in the Blue Max. A couple of very capable drivers in first class equipment. This could go either way. Poldy with the wheels in the air again. Only this time not able to totally recover. Little John Lombardo in the Blue Max. 5.76 seconds, 255 miles per hour. Capaldi's losing 594. Well, this drag race was over almost before it started because Dale Poldy came off the line a little bit too hard, got the wheels off the ground. In the meantime, little John Lombardo just squared up and drove all the way down the drag strip straight as a string to win it by maybe six or seven car lengths. Here you can see the wheels plainly in the air. Now, he didn't want to lift, but when they crashed down, it unloaded the rear tires and they went up in smoke. So the funny car final will be a beauty. Kenny Bernstein versus little John Lombardo, both cars from the state of Texas. Okay, let's go back to the pro stocks and some semifinal action. That is Bob Litton. Notice the door all back in place. Never know it fell off on the racetrack just a, race, a couple of races ago, Steve. No, you certainly wouldn't. Uh, and I'd guess Anna Glidden probably had a lot to do with the way that door looked. She takes great pride in the appearance of their cars. So Glidden getting loose behind that steering wheel. He is up against that gorgeous black and silver car of Dempsey Hardy. Now Hardy is in tough here and he knows it. Taking his time, trying to put a little pressure on Glidden. Oh, and it's Dempsey Hardy that succumbs to the pressure. A red light in the lane of Dempsey Hardy. He is disqualified. Bob Glidden will go to the final round at 7.5 seconds just a little bit, 184 miles per hour. How many times we've seen it before when the guys have to run against either Glidden or Johnson and they squeeze the light too hard. But it's the only way they can beat him, really. But not so with Gordy Rivera. I would say he can face down uh, Warren Johnson in terms of driving skill and raw power, perhaps. I would tell you, off the starting line, there's few any better than Gordy Rivera, and he doesn't get the credit that he deserves, Brock. We saw it a couple of times last year. He beat the best with hole shots, running slower elapsed times. Remember, the lanes are independently timed. The clocks don't start till the wheels leave those electronic beams. Now, Johnson, he's ready. 
He'll be bringing the RPMs up as soon as he sees that Gordy Rivera is ready. They bring him up over 8,000 and slide their foot off the cut. A perfect like for Gordy Rivera. You can't do it any better than that. A perfect like, but it's not enough. Warren guns and blows line at 755, 184 miles an hour. But to Rivera's credit, a perfect lead. Well, he couldn't do any better than that at the start, but it was big horsepower by this man, Warren Johnson, that pulled it out and sends him into the finals against Bob Dutton. Gator National, top fuel dragsters, semifinal round. That is Bill Mullins of Pelham, Alabama. John and Shirley Carey that owned this car had a lot of work to do between rounds to make the call, but here they are. This car has a tremendous top end charge. If they ever get the elapsed time dialed in, it could be a world beater. This is the world beater. Joe Amato, the world champion, as a matter of fact, looking to make it two Gator Nationals in a row. And I'll tell you what, Steve, I'll bet you there's a little matter of pride here with Joe Amato. You know, uh, Kenny Bernstein set the top speed record to this meet in a funny car. Came very close to uh, equaling Joe's all-time speed record at over 260 miles an hour. I'm sure Joe, just for pride's sake, would like to get that top speed record back. And don't you know all the other top fuel competitors are rooting him on, too, because they will take an unmerciful teasing from the Bernstein group. In the far lane, 51 years old, Bill Mullins, looking to get into his first ever final round. Joe Amato, well, he's been in eight final rounds in his last 13 races. And there we see the new Goodyear front tire and the special wheel that we looked at on Don Garland's car. Joe Amato's got them soon. I hope everybody's got them. They're a tremendous safety factor. Bill Mullins has left too soon. A foul start for Bill Mullins. I'm sure Joe Amato does not know he's already won the race. Doesn't matter. He gets there first. No shoot on Amato's car. His wife, Jerry, didn't seem too concerned. This is a good, long, safe racetrack. Amato, 565, 237 miles an hour. He goes in to his ninth final round in the last 13 races. Well, Bill Mullins had upset on his mind. Remember, he knocked off Big Daddy Don Garlitz earlier, but it wasn't to be this time. As we go to the next pairing, that is Gary Ormsby. He'll be going up against Dick LaHaye. And speaking of upset-minded, Dick LaHaye has been on a roll all weekend, Steve. This could be a very, very interesting race. And a very important one for Gary Ormsby. He is second in the World Championship points to Amato. Amato has advanced to the final. Ormsby, if he's to keep pace, has got to get there, too. Now LaHaye staging very slowly, kind of tickling that beam. Gary Ormsby in the near lane. LaHaye, the unpainted, unsponsored car of the four lane. Ormsby is late, way late. Dick LaHaye will win it. Ormsby falls even farther behind Amato in the world's point chase. Joe Amato watching his old friend Dick LaHaye get into the final round where, Joe, you will get a shot at him yourself. The best news, we can win a 570. We've got lane choice. Dick, Dick's a good boy. We'd really like to see him do good. But the cheering was for lane choice. Well, no, not for lane choice. Uh, well, we're cheering for the world championship right now because Ornsby's right behind us. Uh -huh. And that's 200 points. We just moved ahead of him. You know, you got to go every round by round. That's the way you be the world champion. Well, you've been conservative so far today, but I have a feeling the final round, all the stops come out. Well, all the stops come out because uh, we're not going to worry about the blower then <laughs> or anything else. You know, we're going to try and, you know, go out. The only trouble with that, if we do run real fast, it won't be any kind of a record because we have no backup in the starting line. Let's take one more look at the race that made Joe Amato so happy. There goes Dick LaHaye moving in that silver car. You can see Gary Hornsby is already half a car behind when the light goes green. The numbers tell the story. Hornsby clearly faster, 259 miles an hour, much lower ET. Still, he loses it. Well, Dick LaHaye pulls off the upset of the entire Gator Nationals, a tremendous hole shot. He ran much quicker than you did, but you got there first. Well, the thing that was happening was my stage light was flickering on and off, and I had to keep staging deeper and deeper and deeper, and finally the top one went out, and I thought, I'm stopping and just waiting, and I must have cut an awful good light. It's, I asked him if I red-lighted, because the car moved awful hard on the starting line. <laughs> the good news is there was a bright green light, and you're in the finals against Joe Amato, who will be tough. Well... Joe's always tough, but I've raced him before in the finals, and I like Joe, and we're all kind of family, and the best man will win this one. You gave up lane choice. Uh, will that hurt you at all? I've been running in the lane that nobody wants all weekend anyway. <laughs> we'll have a good final round. Dick LaHaye, Joe Amato. So, top fuel, Joe Amato, the world champion against the under... Maybe on the left, or Mrs. Glidden on the right. Brock earlier talked to Bob Glidden. 
Well, the car looks like it's completely buttoned up, and uh, Bob, you look like you're in uh, a very calm state of mind. I, I think it brings to mind a question that perhaps nobody's asked you for a long, long time. You know, you're a your professional have made thousands of runs on a drag strip uh, over the years. Do you still like to race? I mean, just as a pure competitive moment, do you, do you enjoy it, or has it become basically a job to you? Well, when things are going well and you're running good, you've got a shot at winning a race, it's easy to enjoy doing it. Uh, we, we got ourselves into a slump a couple of years ago and, and went through that slump for over a year, and at that point it wasn't much fun. Uh, right now, today, it's a lot of fun. Win, lose, or draw. You know, we're going to have a uh, just a hell of a time out here today. We're going to make a, a good race. Johnson's running well. We're running well. And we're going to have a good time. Win, lose, or draw. And we're going to have a good time watching it. Can Warren Johnson in that burgundy Oldsmobile Calais make it two in a row? Remember, he won here a year ago. Or will it be Bob Glidden? Glidden knows it's going to be a driver's race right off that starting line. And he is pumped up and ready. It sounded to me like that. Well, Steve, they both are, and remember, these guys probably bring more horsepower into pro stock racing than any two other cars and driver combination. Warren Johnson's having a little bit of problem, we said earlier, getting this little Olds Calais sorted out. A lot smaller than the old Cutlass he ran last year. And, of course, Bob Glidden now into his second season with his very sleek Thunderbird. All right, here they go. The RPMs go up. It is Warren Johnson off the mark first. Warren Johnson with an immediate advantage. Here comes Glidden. No. Mrs. Johnson will make out that deposit slip and look at the speed. As fast as any pro stock car has ever run an NHRA competition, 188 miles an hour for Warren Johnson. So imagine what some of these pro stocks are going to run 190, and it may be soon. 7.16 second ET. A marvelous race. Very, very close all the way. Warren Johnson, though, out just a little bit ahead and never gave that lead up. Bob Glidden gave it all he could, but it was Johnson at the end. A classic pro stock race between two of the great champions. As you see, Warren Johnson crosses the line about a half a car length ahead of Bob Glidden. Let's go to the winner. Warren Johnson wins his second consecutive Gator Nationals, and you won it all the way. You were off the mark first, and it was really not a contest at the finish line. Well, I liked winning the race, but it was kind of disappointing because he didn't run another 55. So. <laughs> but uh, this, this race is a really significant one for me. Uh, like I said before, I've never won two NHRA uh, consecutive races, and I really have to say this race belongs to the crew just as well as uh, it belongs to me because the fact that they prepared the car uh, well, which is... An example of the 55 runs, a consecutive car is a consistent piece, and all I have to do is sit in and drive it. And the fans go and watch the funny cars on the top field drags, just how hard they work on those cars at the races. All your work really takes place at the shop, 80-hour uh, weeks. That's correct, Steve. Uh, all our work is definitely at the shop. Uh, we don't have time to finesse these motors at the, at the racetrack because there's too much intricate hand labor involved on these motors, porting cylinder heads, massaging pistons, and so forth, where their type of racing is uh, based on just replacing parts only, not really finessing them as we try to do. Nice job. Thank you, Steve. Our congratulations to Warren as well, but we're far from through here at Gainesville. It's funny car final time. Kenny Bernstein versus little John Lombardo in the blue max. Now, every one of these teams brings a specialist with them to the race. He's the man that makes the critical adjustments on these clutches. Earlier, Steve had a chance to talk to the blue max specialist. Well, Fred Miller, there's nothing more important uh, than the clutch when you go into a final round as tight as you guys are with Bernstein. Uh, yeah. Uh, we thought all day here we've had not a problem with the clutch, but that's what's been wrong with the car. So we're trying to keep a close eye on it. We ordinarily don't do this every round, but uh, for the final, you got to do it because this will win us, win us this race if it's right. Well, this is a four-disc clutch. You've got four discs, and between each pair of discs is a floater plate, a metal floater plate, much like a flywheel, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got three floaters and four discs, and uh, it's just a matter of if it's slipping too much is our problem right now, so we're trying to cure that. There's really two adjustments you can make on a clutch like this. Yeah, there is. You can either adjust the clearance in the pack, or you can go with the weight, uh, put weight on or take weight off, which is all... <laughs> all relevant to each other. Which all has to do with how soon that clutch will hook up down the racetrack, how much slippage is involved to absorb a lot of that excess horsepower. 
So uh, three men are working on the motor, but only one is in charge of the clutch. It's a one-man job. Understand that if that clutch just locks up, it will burn the rear tires right off of the wheels. The clutch has to absorb the excess horsepower until the car is far enough down the racetrack to use all of it. So it's little John Lombardo against the man who has all of the teams talking to themselves, Kenny Bernstein. His crew chief, Dale Armstrong, a borderline genius, has taken advantage of every rule in the book. The car has the maximum allowable 40-inch front overhang for rollout on the elapsed time clock. As you said, Brock, it has been in the wind tunnel. It was designed to the wind tunnel. The most sophisticated fuel system anyone has ever seen. Bernstein looking to make it two in a row. Fifty-four miles an hour, 5.70. Nonetheless, the Money Car Championship here at Gainesville goes to Kenny Bernstein, and it happened right here, just a few feet beyond the Christmas tree. John Lombardo up in smoke. Let's go to Steve with Bernstein. Well, first Warren Johnson makes it two in a row. Now Kenny Bernstein, two Gator Nationals victories in a row. Oh, that's super. We're just tickled to death, uh, Steve. Needless to say. Thank all our fans and Budweiser Motorcraft and Ford, and especially Dale Armstrong and Jeff Scarp and the crew guys. You know, I know you wanted both ends of the record. You got one in. That's bonus points towards the world title. The engine from d down here anyway sounded a little ragged right off of the line, and maybe that's where the speed went. Well, it may have been. We were afraid to really hop it up too much more from the 64 run because we didn't want to smoke the tires to get the mile per hour back. But our one goal here was to win the Winston World Points right here to go to the championship, so that's what we did. A big step towards that right here. Hey, I appreciate it. You bet. <laughs> Fine job by Kenny Bernstein and the entire crew. So Kenny Bernstein joins Warren Johnson as a repeat winner here at Gainesville. Now, the question is, will this man, Joe Amato, join them to make a hat trick for history? So that is Dick LaHaye, perhaps on the verge of the greatest victory of his career, the top fuel title here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals in Gainesville. Earlier, Steve Evans had a chance to talk about and to the young lady who has had such a great bearing on his success. A lot of attractive young girls in their early 20s dream of being actresses, models, airline stewardesses, the glamour jobs. Well, Kim LaHaye considers what she's doing right now to be a glamour job because she may help her dad win an important drag race. Kim, you get a little greasy down here, don't you, kid? Well, I get a little bit dirty, but it's a lot of fun. You know, you guys are running a very conservative operation here. You're not putting a lot of pistons in uh, like the Joe Amatos and the, some of the others. Uh-huh. We, we have to run it pretty conservative so that we can race all year. We have to race weekend to weekend and make a living at it, so we try to be real conservative. So what kind of preparations have you and your dad decided on to race Joe Amato? Go for broke or maintain that conservative attitude? We're going to step on it a little bit, but not too much. We're still going to try to be conservative with it, but we want to win the race. Well, all this oil can't be good, too good for the hair and the complexion. Well, actually, the oil is probably the best conditioner for your hair there is. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Lay, great attitude. All right, well, let's see if they've conditioned the motor because they're going up against a man who perhaps brings as much or more horsepower into top fuel drag racing than anybody, Steve. Well, he said earlier, Brock, that he's willing to clean another blower up this thing if he has to. The points mean that much to it. He wants to be the repeat world champion, and there's no better time to start than right now. And then the other hand, Dick LaHaye has to watch his pennies. He'll be a little bit more careful, hopefully not burning up a motor in trying to win this championship. But you can be sure when it comes down to just cutting the pedal to the metal, LaHaye will go up against anybody. And weighing a little bit on Joe Amato's mind is the fact that Dick LaHaye has holes out of everybody he's raced today. Amato can't let him get away too far, or he just might not catch it, even with his mega horsepower. All right, the front wheels are now positioned exactly on the starting line. It is LaHaye away first again. What a job this man has done in that cockpit. It is LaHaye by a car like that does Kim ever love it. LaHaye upsets Joe Amato, 565, 248 miles an hour, and that smile says it all. What a drive, and Dick LaHaye beats the champion straight up. No excuses here for Joe Amato. No wheel stands, no uh, toss blowers, nothing that he can really call other than the fact that Dick LaHaye out drove him all the way to the most stunning victory of his particular career. What a great finish to the Gator Nationals. Dick LaHaye being congratulated by the Joe Amato crew. Jerry Amato giving him a hug, said that we had to get beat. It might as well be by a real good guy. 
And Kim, you got to be proud of your dad today. Hey, he's been doing an excellent driving job all day. He's just doing fantastic. What a job this young lady has done. I mean, on the engine, under the engine, anywhere she had to be. Yeah, we, we actually hurt two pistons at this race. It, we hurt one in the second round and one in the third round. And I think we got her fixed now. It didn't hurt anything that run. And, you know, it's, I couldn't do it without this lady right here. It's nice to win a big one and know you haven't already spent the money and parts you broke to do it. Oh, I hope yeah. to tell you. Yeah, I mean, the one cylinder head never came off the engine. It, we had to take the left one off twice. Congratulations, both of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Brock Yates is with a man who, even in defeat, always does it with great style. Well, you, you said earlier that you thought he was going to be a serious contender in this, in this race, and it turned out to be that way. Yeah, I know he was, you know, he was there. As it turned out, we were just taking it easy with the motor all day, just feathering with the problem with the blowers, and maybe we should have been a little more aggressive looking back on it, but then again, you can't be aggressive when you're having problems. Yeah, were you, were you, did you take it easy? Uh, a lot of people thought maybe you'd uh, step it up a little bit for the final, but you didn't. Uh, you were still worried about that blower problem? No, 